Hello, everyone. It's wonderful to know that many of you have been, have been inspired by my book, and it's an honor to be able to address you today in this annual gathering. Do you realize how incredible it is that we're in the middle of this pandemic and we can actually talk to each other thanks to the internet and thanks to this whole system? Not only that, can you imagine this without the genome? We wouldn't even know the genome in order to fight the pandemic. We're really in the middle of a marvelous technological revolution. And that's what I want to talk to you about. I'm going to talk to you about the social shaping of technological revolutions. And I will particularly try to focus on blockchain and artificial intelligence in this information age. The difference between revolutionary technologies and technological revolutions and the structure and impact of such revolutions. Then the question, are new powerful technologies enough to bring about a golden age? And finally, what can blockchain and artificial intelligence do to enable such a golden age? So let's begin with the difference. What's a revolutionary technology? It's a radical break with past practices which can transform one or many industries and products and lead to one or several new technology systems up and downstream. So it's a pretty important thing, a revolutionary technology. So let's take a look at one of them, plastics, for instance, which was, of course, in the 20th century. So it's a revolutionary technology which has many systems. Look at that, successive technologies downstream, the whole range of consumer durables, radio, TV, kitchen appliances, toys, games, textile, fibers, furniture, packaging, bottling, what wasn't changed by plastics. And then industrial supplies, of course, aerospace, automobile industry, yachts, boats, construction materials, anything you imagine, every single industry was changed by plastics. And there were also successive technologies upstream because in order to be able to use any of those things, you needed injection, compression, glow molding, extrusion, calendaring, etc., plus chemicals, assembly, measuring, control instruments, a whole lot. Many, many innovations, all associated with the fact that plastics were replacing practically every imaginable material. And yet, it was not a revolution. Lots of people, of course, thought that it was a revolution. And it was a revolutionary technology, a revolutionary technology system. Today, artificial intelligence and blockchain are promising similar feats. So if we look at these two revolutionary technologies with infinite uses leading to several technology systems, we can think that artificial intelligence may evolve as the dominant technology for extracting data and processing meaning in multiple areas. The same thing about blockchain, it could be the dominant system for securely transforming organizations from those of democracy to those handling property, logistics, money, and other socially complex processes. So we're talking about two pretty major technologies, but neither in itself constitutes a technological revolution. So what is a technological revolution? It's an evolving set of revolutionary technologies and their interrelated systems. So in fact, it, it takes into account many revolutionary technologies and they're all interrelated and they all follow the same techno-economic paradigm, which is like the common sense for best practice innovation and for best practice even in consumption. So let's look at the mass production revolution, which is the previous one, of course, the one that was there in the 20th century from the 1910s. Uh, we have a combination of cheap oil in the, the essential uh, product of the whole revolution was oil with the internal combustion engine, of course, and then petrochemicals and fuel and electricity networks. So we're talking about pretty major things. So the systems downstream of this whole technological revolution include plastics as one of the many and chemicals, soap and cleaning, pharmaceuticals, agricultural inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and so on, changing agriculture significantly, construction materials, the whole lot. And then with the fuel and electricity networks, we have metallurgy, electrical industry, 
uh, road and highway construction, asphalt, and in the middle, in the core determining thing in terms of consumer products, we have the durables, the electrical appliances, and of course, the automobile, the mark of the 20th century, the core of the mass production revolution. So then, of course, we also have a whole set of technology systems upstream that have to do with oil exploration, with electrical and chemical plant design and construction, measuring control instruments, special chemicals, all that range, this enormous number of technologies are all interrelated, they're all interdependent, and that's why they're capable of forming what we can call a revolution. And then let's look at ours. Let's look at the information revolution that's been diffusing since the 1970s with the microprocessor. We have at its center microelectronic chips, which are in absolutely everything we do, computers and software, and telecoms and internet. Those are the big elements of this revolution. And then we come down to the successive innovations downstream, the ones related just, I mean, it's very difficult. These graphs, by the way, don't take them as a very serious organized thing. This is like a, a picture, a general feeling, a loose set of the elements that conform this revolution. So we have specialized equipment for medicine and military and all the rest. We had computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, FMS controls, robots, 3D printers, office and personal products, future self-driving cars, virtual reality, all these things that are still to come, information, education, and telecoms internet. We have commerce, banking, fintech, multimedia, podcast, social media, surveillance, surveillance, GPS, quantify itself, search engines, Wikipedia, satellites, mobile phones, all those things, and the things that combine the two, the latest uh, systems, the smartphones, artificial intelligence, big data, blockchain, cryptocurrencies, all these things are still developing. These are the later systems that are, have been now transforming and are ready to transform uh, production even more and the way we live and the way we interact. And of course, lots of successive innovations upstreams uh, from special equipment to firmware, software, frontier science, satellites, new materials, fiber optics, and so on. So let's look actually at technological revolutions now, their structure and their impact. First of all, it's interesting to discover that there is a regular structure of technological revolutions. Beginning with the Industrial Revolution in England, they all have a regular composition. They all have a cheap key input that changes the relative cost structure for all inputs so that people decide to produce and they are able to produce low cost things thanks to the fact the existence of that cheap key input, which is a big innovation in most cases. Then we have the multi-purpose technologies supporting most industries and creating new ones and one or more new infrastructures. It's very important to have an infrastructure in order to widen reachable markets with lower costs of access. So the first was the water-driven machinery with cheap water power and the use of canals. The second, steam-driven machinery and processes with cheap coal and railroads as the infrastructure. Then the third revolution was the revolution of steam, electrical and oil driven machinery, cheap steel as the cheap input. So it wasn't an energy sector, an energy factor. It was actually a material. And then that allowed the worldwide steamships, telegraph and railways. Can you imagine telegraph? They had the cables going from England to the US and then all the way across the Pacific. The whole world was surrounded by steel telegraph cables and of course, transcontinental railways and the steamships. That was the first globalization. Then the fourth revolution, the one we just talked about, the mass production revolution, the mass production methods, the internal combustion engine and plastics, of course, with cheap oil and petrochemicals and the road and highway networks plus airports plus electricity. And our fifth revolution, Computers and software are the actual multi-purpose technology in all their variety. Microelectronics and information, both cheap, and then internet and container ships, perhaps we could count as part of the 
infrastructure, the internet for intangibles and containerships for all physical products. So each of those sets defines a different paradigm for innovation, general, a general paradigm to take best advantage of the new potential. The other common thing is that each technological revolution only comes together when the preceding one reaches limits. So the new things, the innovations, are aiming to overcome the limits of the previous revolution that's already having trouble. You know, we had stagflation in the 70s and the 80s, and that is precisely because of the limits that mass production had reached. So what are those limits and why were the digital solutions useful? First of all, we had these multi-layered control pyramids, it's huge, lots of white collar workers and managers, several layers of management. And the digital solution was to have empowered flat networks because you could use computers to, to do all the relaying. Then the slow top heavy admin bureaucracy, we now can have with digital agile organizations and of course, digital record keeping. The international hub and spoke structures where you had every single company was actually like a little midget bit of the big company. Now the complex global networks where you actually separate and it's just one huge global network, much more, even though it's gigantic, much more manageable thanks to digital technologies. We had the three layer variety annual model. So you had to have the big, medium and small and so on. And you only changed every year. Now you have multiple customized computer aided design products. Then the other limit, no more services to turn into products. You know, if you think of the electrical appliances, for instance, for the home that began with such important things, such as the refrigerator, the vacuum cleaner, you know, really pretty major things you get at the end, the electric can opener, the electric carving knife. I mean, there was just nothing else. What are we doing now? Thanks to digital solutions, we're turning products into services instead. So now we have, we stream music, we stream film, and the same with many other things. We still have many other things to change. So the transformations have been astonishing and wide ranging, but the social benefits have not yet come at the same scale. We are not yet in the deployment period of the information revolution. As some of you may remember or know, we have each revolution has two periods, the installation period, which is a period of creative construction where all the new things come. It's led by financial capital and it goes from eruption of the revolution through to bubble collapse or collapses. And then we come to the turning point, which is characterized by instability, uncertainty, and very much social unrest and populism. That's a very typical thing that happens. Political parties divide, new movements emerge. There is all because of the creative destruction, because all the jobs that are lost, because everybody, you know, life has changed for the worse for many people. So that's why some populist leaders look to the past, which was better. And then we come to the deployment period, which we have, I believe, ahead because we are actually at the end of the turning point. And this period of creative construction, which is led by production capital, supported by the state, goes from golden age to maturity. And once, of course, you get to maturity, then the next revolution has to come. So, the deployment is when golden ages are unleashed. So we would have the golden age ahead at some point, if finally all of us and politicians understand that we need to organize the way that technologies, we need to shape technologies so that they will really be for the benefit of everybody. So perhaps the destruction of the COVID-19 pandemic will have an effect similar to post-World War II because it is after World War II that the New Deal was actually set up and everybody thought it was fantastic. Everybody accepted the role of the state and everybody accepted that it was good for people to have high salaries, for people to have a good life. Of course, we had suburbanization, which meant that there was a lot of consumption. Everybody was consuming automobiles and 
electrical appliances and frozen food and everything else that could be produced with that revolution. And that's what we need to have now. So very important, during installation, innovation is supply driven. So while we're still in installation, we're inventing and proposing, inventing and proposing. So it's a huge experiment in the market. What will people accept? What will work? What's going to be profitable? What's going to be successful? We're in that whole process constantly. In deployment, innovation drives and is driven by new lifestyles which define the new demand. So in fact, once the innovations have been accepted, it's basically more and more of the same sort of direction. It's like a synergy that comes between the lifestyles and what's being produced. It's important to see then the different, that different lifestyles that are enabled by each golden age are what really lead to the new jobs that are able to cater to those lifestyles. So this sort of uncertain, precarious situation of employment, and there are countries where they have 25% unemployment, 15% unemployment, others have done better in different ways, but basically, very much depends on the possibility of catering to the new lifestyles. So if we look, for instance, at urban Victorian li living in the second revolution, the age of steam, coal, iron railways, and so on, what we find is that there was a new urban lifestyle that was very different from the country style of the aristocrats. It was basically urban, and that was the big change that was made then. Then we come to the cosmopolitan living in the Belle Epoque with all the theaters and the reading and you know all these things, universal people traveling all over the world and bringing things. So that was the age of steel and heavy engineering, the first globalization created the cosmopolitan lifestyle. And then we come to the suburban family living, father, mother and two kids in a suburban house with an automobile and electrical appliances and so on. All those products were preferably plastic, of course, and lots of new jobs in construction and services. Now we are in the process now of learning the patterns of the new digital and sustainable good life because the new life is going to have to be sustainable for our planet. So we are using information technology in order to transform lifestyles. And the question is, are the new technologies in themselves, however powerful enough to bring about a golden age? The simple answer is no. It all depends on our understanding of golden ages, of course. The first thing to understand is that income polarization, this whole inequality issue that we've been discussing so much, because it's been amazing. I mean, if you look at the data for the past 30 or 40 years, incomes of what was called the middle class have been stagnant and all, you know, the 1% is what's receiving everything. And that's not a stable society and that's not ethical capitalism. So the, the whole, that inequality is typical of free market installation period and major bubble times. So look at this. This is, we have two periods here. We have the uh, installation of the mass production revolution and here we have the installation of the information revolution. In both cases the top one percent of taxpayers, this is the USA from 1913 to 2018 to two years ago, uh, 25%, one, the one percent has received 25 percent of income including capital gains. And look at this, when we get to the golden age they're getting 10% of, of a big, you know, it's not like a little bit. It's still, they're not really receiving that much less. The thing is that it's being, it's much more wealth being distributed in a better way so that the majority of the population can benefit. So that is what golden age is about. Golden age deployment periods tend to reverse the polarization, the inequality process. They improve, they incorporate new layers of the population into a good life. What do we need to unleash a golden age? The context must be changed to create a win-win game between business and society. Only the state can do that. 
by redesigning taxation regulation policies and institutions to tilt the playing field in synergistic direction so that everybody innovates in similar ways and so that it all works towards a particular uh, lifestyle which improves the lives of the many and how is that best direction i mean where do you get it from from your head how is it identified and put in practice it's a socio-political choice among the many made possible by the new technology so it's not that you invented it's not some advisor or some politician or some civil service no this is actually a, a choice which is generally socio-political it's actually in a way uh, defined by society itself but government must not create but rather intensify and accelerate one or more directions that are already existing trends so it's accelerating some and not necessarily accelerating others you don't have to stop them but you improve you intensify trends that are already already there and that are obviously going in a good social direction at the same time as making money well you know what hitler stalin and the western democracies had the same mass production revolution to shape and they shaped it very differently so in what directions was the mass production revolution politically shaped in the west it was shaped in the direction of suburbanization and the cold war sorry about my british spelling <laughs> So suburbanization meant that everybody was going to have a car because you had to go back and forth and all the electrical appliances and the whole construction plus a shopping mall so that you could go. And so you had a lot of employment created in this multiple, so many areas, which were now cheap land, cheap houses on cheap land, because of course, city land was very expensive but suburban land was not all you had to do with the car which changed the whole panorama was to create the uh, roads that would go to this suburban area and then developers would come and do the whole thing and people could then afford houses and could afford to fill them and to fill the refrigerators and we had the prosperous boom of the 1950s and 60s after the war with high taxation and a very strong welfare state that really supported people fully. And government innovated with the same structure as the divisional corporations using their Tayloristic processes. So corporations were successful with that big pyramidal structure with all the divisions and so on and with their processes of leave your brain at home and we'll design the assembly line and so on. And this was, you know, this was the way to do it. That was the way that success was achieved by business and later by government. So in what directions can the current information revolution be shaped? I suggest smart green growth and full global development. Smart because it's with ICT, green growth because that's the direction, save the planet, and full global development because in order to save the planet we need both but also because for the advanced world to have uh, markets it's very important that the developing world would need equipment which can be designed sustainably and so on because basically the um, consumer goods the mass consumer goods are being produced in asia and it's not they're not coming back and if they come back they will be made by robots so if we want employment in the advanced world, we need development in the developing world. So those two things would be the two directions that could bring a global sustainable golden age. And they would need fair modernized taxation, redesigning the welfare state. We just saw how many people were in the gig economy. And, and as soon as we have the quarantine, we realized that so many people in, in Britain alone there are 5 million people that are in uh, precarious employment. And of course, there is all the self-employed people, very often not self-employed because they want to, but because they must, because they have no other choice. So we need to set up a welfare state, which I believe should have universal basic income. 
agreeing with many of you. Uh, with government, of course, innovating using what business uses. So we need frontier digital technologies. We need to transition to a fully digitized, multi-level and agile structure of government. We cannot continue having a structure of government which has all the limits of mass production and which was copied from the old model rather than from the new one. So after 50 years of anti-government action and faith in the magic power of the free market, COVID-19 has revealed both the resulting injustice within, injustice within society and the importance of government action to reverse it. Free market libertarian and stateless utopias are as flawed as the communist ones, I'm sorry to say. So what could blockchain and artificial intelligence do to enable the golden age? As happens with all technologies and technological revolutions, artificial intelligence, blockchain, and all the other information technologies can be used in a wide range of directions, from those with dark, selfish purposes to the most widely beneficial ones. We are seeing this problem already. They can be used to centralize, survey, and control, or to democratize and empower. However, in order to achieve this, we will need digital natives to have the idea of how we can regulate the powerful companies that the data, the ones that control the data. So the time for such choices is now and blockchain, artificial intelligence and other revolutionary technologies can contribute to the transformation of our societies. They can provide efficiency, security, privacy, efficacy, and ease of use in the transition to a 21st century model of governance. The general functioning of democracy and the civil service should be modernized. The social safety net, hopefully including universal basic income, as I said before. An automated taxation system, privacy protected and fraud preventing. Secure health records for informed health research city planning and reliable property records, an effective identity system, etc., 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 while delivering, of course, multiple financial and other services for private business and consumers. These are major challenges for entrepreneurs and innovators. Improving the world while making money is a much greater and more worthwhile objective than just making money. And business can only ignore inequality, underdevelopment, and climate change at its own peril. You can read some more about my work in those web pages and in Twitter. Thank you.